Uh, this is truly an exciting endeavor, and I wish all the participants good luck. I'd like to start by thanking everyone at the uh, Global Infrastructure Hub for extending me the privilege of addressing you today. My particular thanks go out to Mary Lamfredo, who has done such a terrific job at developing the organization and establishing it as a critical resource for understanding and appreciating the massive role that infrastructure plays in economic development. <clears throat> I can't emphasize enough the importance of the GI Hub as a source of information and as a generator of actionable ideas. The competition is of particular interest to me because it addresses such an urgent need in the evolution of infrastructure and also because it so perfectly bridges my worlds. I'm fully engaged with infrastructure policy, but from the perspective of an investor. And at my firm, we've realized the importance of technology and infrastructure and have become an active investor in that field. So I've been fortunate enough to see the very exciting innovations emerging at the intersection of infrastructure and technology. It's an intersection that doesn't get nearly enough attention. And I hope that in our discussion today, and more significantly in all the work your organization is doing, we can begin to remedy that and talk about how to truly create the infrastructure of the 21st century. The prevailing perception of infrastructure is that it's not technology driven, but rather industrial, static, and heavily regulated. This perception is pervasive and widespread. Recently, I conducted a survey of a thousand Americans about their perceptions of infrastructure. The results are available on the website of the Development Research Institute at New York University. My goal was to understand and help inform the current US debate over infrastructure legislation. And when I asked the respondents to define infrastructure, by far the most popular answer with 66% responding was, roads, bridges, and tunnels. Technology, unfortunately, was nowhere in the picture. The recent debate about the Biden administration's infrastructure investment plan, Build Back Better, was dominated by the same perception. It centered on the differences between traditional infrastructure, basically roads, bridges, and other transportation components, and non-traditional infrastructure in sectors such as health and education. But I believe this has been the wrong debate. The Biden administration got it right. There is no meaningful distinction between traditional and non-traditional infrastructure. What we should instead be discussing is the true nature of our infrastructure needs. The focus going forward should be on smart, sustainable infrastructure that covers all sectors. The breadth of areas covered by the competitors illustrates exactly this point. What the infrastructure investment plan proposed by President Biden offers for the first time, as I'll discuss later, is precisely the investment in technology and infrastructure necessary to improve delivery and reliability and to make infrastructure sustainable and resilient to climate change. Now, there are reasons why our traditional infrastructure has been slow in adopting new technology. What makes infrastructure as an asset class attractive to investors? Key characteristics include regulation, predictable cash flows through long-term contracts, long-duration assets, relatively high barriers to entry, and correlation to inflation. Paradoxically, these are the same characteristics that have traditionally discouraged the adoption of new technologies. Since 1995, labor productivity in non-store retail outgrew infrastructure sector productivity by a factor of four. These productivity gains were driven by the extraordinary adoption of technology in that sector compared to infrastructure. We in the infrastructure sectors cannot afford to miss out on such gains or on the other advantages that investment in modern technology-driven infrastructure can provide. Why not? Well, the reason has to do with another area of your organization's focus, the critical role of infrastructure in promoting economic development. This is something we know well, but it's always worthwhile to remind ourselves that there is a strong connection between investment in infrastructure and economic growth in both the developed and the developing world. A recent report by the IMF 
reaffirm the importance of public investment to economic growth and made the case for scaling up infrastructure investment, especially during a recovery period. Specifically, with regard to infrastructure and looking at the US, studies have suggested that every 100 billion in infrastructure spending can boost GDP by up to 150 billion. This increase in GDP could increase employment by an additional 1 million workers. This plays out, by the way, globally as well. Increasing infrastructure investment by one percentage point of GDP could generate up to 3.4 million jobs in India and up to 1.3 million jobs in Brazil. So that would seem to be an airtight case for infrastructure investment. And yet, we are falling short. Despite global spending of 3.3 trillion per year in the transport, power, water, telecom systems, as well as social infrastructure, current spending levels are well below the world's infrastructure capital needs. And this is a constraining factor to broader economic growth and technology adoption. To maintain sustainable growth rates, spending levels would need to address an infrastructure investment deficit of $18 trillion, including deferred spending for the maintenance and or replacement of aging infrastructure in many countries. In the US, the picture is similar, but perhaps more dire. US infrastructure investment went into sharp decline starting in 1970 and has never recovered. It currently sits at approximately 1% of GDP. The American Society of Civil Engineers estimates that infrastructure investment is 2.5 trillion short of the level needed just to bring existing infrastructure into an adequate state of repair, that is, without starting any new projects and further predicts that if the 10-year infrastructure gap of 2 trillion is not addressed, the cost will be 10 trillion in US GDP by 2039. Now, I don't want to go off topic, but it's worth mentioning that China, by contrast, dramatically ramped up its infrastructure investments since the 1980s to a level currently estimated at 8% of GDP and has been able to export its infrastructure know-how and industrial capacity globally. I have argued in a recent paper published by the Wilson Center in Washington, DC, that the investment in sustainable infrastructure should be a common goal for all. And I sincerely hope that all members of the G20 will collaborate to invest jointly in the infrastructure technologies that will make our global economic system more efficient. This will ensure sustainable economic growth in an equitable manner for the coming decades, rather than compete in an area where our needs are so great. More immediately relevant to our conversation is the fact that we in the US now have the opportunity to begin to build our infrastructure back better and reverse that neglect. The pressing questions are how and how do we get there? Within the next two weeks, we may see a dramatic increase in US infrastructure investment via the passage of the 1.2 trillion bipartisan infrastructure framework and the 3.5 trillion reconciliation package. The two measures are the subject of intense debate that is only going to increase in the coming days. But as interesting to us as the amount of investment is also the direction that it might take. Fortunately, there is the promise that the current legislation proposed by the president in final form will begin to move us in the direction of technology-focused infrastructure. The bipartisan infrastructure plan includes funding for capital expenditure as well as technology R&D. For example, seven and a half billion for electric vehicles, charging stations, $5 billion for electric school buses, 47 billion for cybersecurity and climate change measures, 65 billion for broadband infrastructure and 65 billion to modernize the power grid. This is all good news. Technology and R&D funding should be an integral part of any infrastructure investment program. Through the resulting increased productivity, it will enable us to reduce capital investment requirements. But at a more basic level, it will allow us to build infrastructure that matches our needs. So what are those needs? The short answer is that our global infrastructure is increasingly under massive stress. But rapidly emerging technologies afford us the means to make infrastructure resilient and to align it with 21st century conditions of engagement. Among those conditions are long-term secular factors, urbanization, population growth, and rising energy consumption. 
These pose increasingly complex challenges to the infrastructure sector as available space and resource options are more and more constrained. Then add immediate emerging stressors, climate change, COVID-19 pandemic, cyber attack, and the inherent vulnerability of complex infrastructure systems. So let's discuss in more details. Population growth. The global population is rapidly increasing and with it infrastructure demand. The UN estimates that by 2050, global population will have risen to 9.7 billion people with 87% of the population situated in growth economies. But a significant portion of the legacy infrastructure in use today is outdated. This creates a dual challenge, having to replace assets globally as they go out of operation and increasing the total amount of infrastructure built in order to serve and support these populations and local economies. While this is a challenge, it's also, of course, the opportunity to introduce technology and fundamentally alter the way we deliver infrastructure service. Increasing density and urbanization. The World Bank estimates that in 1960, under 35% of the global population lived in urbanized areas. By 2018, that figure had risen to nearly 55% and is expected to grow to over 75% in the coming decades. The challenges that infrastructure operators globally will face in the coming years will be focused on the demands of urban centers and the need to develop smart cities. Construction boom. With population growth and urban density comes construction. Between 2020 and 2060, it's estimated that nearly 186 billion square meters of buildings will be constructed. Now that's equivalent to erecting another New York City every month for the next 40 years. I think it's worth repeating. It's equivalent to erecting another New York City every month for the next 40 years. So it further establishes the existential need for smart city infrastructure. So I'll give you an example. Buildings are among the largest contributors to global warming. Concrete and steel industries represent 10% of the world's annual greenhouse gas emissions. In operating these buildings and assets, heating and cooling via HVAC systems consumes more energy than any other household appliances. So this creates a vicious circle. As the world gets richer and more populous, it also gets hotter with HVAC installations expected to rise from 1.6 billion units in 2020 to over 5 billion by 2050. So smart metering, smart HVAC systems offer a solution to one of the most negative effects of these secular global trends. COVID-19. The global pandemic is well into its second year. Many of the changes it imposes will be long lasting, and that means that they will have a lasting effect on how infrastructure services are offered. Social infrastructure, for example, is expected to see a drastic change in its operating model as remote healthcare and education remain essential and broadband networks must be sufficient to handle the massively increased demands of remote work. Climate. Recent debates have centered on the merits of green or climate-friendly infrastructure, cutting edging technologies such as wind turbines and solar farms, for example. I think it's another false distinction. All forms of infrastructure, even the most conventional roads and bridges have a climate impact and all of them can and must be greener. The fundamental need it is not for discrete technologies, but for a transformation of industrial processes and the greening of all infrastructure. The industrial sector by itself accounts for 23% of US carbon emissions. Some uh, in the recent past have argued against windmills in favor of roads, bridges, and tunnels. But roads are made of bitumen, a petroleum product. Concrete is one of the most water and resource intensive materials. Steel is forged by burning coal. Every road or bridge, even if it's filled with electric vehicles, has a massive carbon footprint if built with conventional materials. Technology offers answers. Alternative materials and processes exist. Roads can be surfaced with bitumen mixed with recycled plastic. Novel forms of concrete are capable of storing carbon. Steel can be produced using carbon capture technologies. The energy industry is making progress towards green hydrogen as an energy source, though more progress, of course, must be made for hydrogen production to truly be clean. 
Next, complexity and vulnerability. So finally, there's the inherent vulnerability of complex systems to other factors such as cyber attack and to their own unpredictability unless protective technologies are deployed. In May of this year, a ransomware attack shut down the colonial pipeline in the US and crippled fuel delivery to the US Southeast and Mid-Atlantic. The US East Coast was without 45% of its gasoline and jet fuel supply for one whole week. Cybersecurity protections in much of our infrastructure are inadequate as a result of chronic underinvestment and for the same reason, operational technology, OT solutions, often lack the necessary redundancy. I've recently invested in an operational technology OT cybersecurity company that helps customers reveal, protect, and manage their connected physical infrastructure assets. In January of this year, a massive failure of the Texas power grid caused by underinvestment as well as weather, inadequate winterization, and unfortunately poor policy decision left four and a half million homes without power for days, killed 151 people, and caused property damages in excess of $190 billion. A smart, modern, resilient grid would not have mitigated all the damage, but it would have greatly reduced the impact of the outage, shortened its duration, and greatly lessened the suffering. Just this month, Hurricane Ida, the second most damaging hurricane in the US history, gave us another lesson in the fragility of our infrastructure and the need for technology to improve the resiliency of the grid system. In the face of all these stresses, the challenge, which our finalists today are working so hard to meet, is to match the technology to the task and ensure that it is integral to infrastructure. How do we make that happen? The answer is to close the massive infrastructure funding gap I spoke of earlier. While government initiatives, such as the infrastructure legislation currently making its way through the US Congress, will be no doubt a huge boost, the hard truth is that the spending levels proposed here and elsewhere in the world are simply not adequate to the need. Governments around the world will simply not be able to fund all the infrastructure they need or to support the R&D needed to introduce technology to infrastructure. So I'll close by sharing with you my conviction that the private sector must rise to the occasion and close the gap, and that mechanisms must be created to allow that to happen. The private sector is both able and willing to invest. From an investor's perspective, technology will make infrastructure assets more efficient and more critical to economic growth. That means investing in green technology-led infrastructure in addition to hard asset infrastructure. Those who don't will find themselves owning stranded assets sooner than one thinks. The capital is there. There is over $40 trillion in the global pension system and the private capital markets. Individual investors are capable of investing still more. For example, I've suggested the creation of special savings accounts for US households that could raise as much as 400 billion a year dedicated to long-term infrastructure investments. This private funding is not subject to the uncertainty associated with government funding but barriers must be removed and vehicles must be created to allow this to happen. My message to you today is about the need for innovation, both in infrastructure technology and infrastructure funding. Our needs are great, but time is short. I hope that through initiatives such as the G20 Infra Challenge and through needed policy measures, we can turbocharge infrastructure development throughout the globe. And now, like you, I'm excited to meet our finalists and find out who our winner will be. The best of luck to all the contestants and to all of you. Thank you so much for your time today.